Well, uh, there they were, moving forward, one step at a time. But continually, they would look over their shoulder and look behind. They had been doing that the few days before with horror or terror, and now they're grinning. Not just like a casual smile across their face, but, but like ear to ear, grinning. Everyone was talking about it. Everyone was amazed. No one had ever seen anything like this before. In fact, nobody had ever even heard of anything like this before. The Hebrew people now numbered hundreds of thousands of people. They were a legitimate nation. And for 400 years, they'd been living in a foreign land in Egypt. They moved there by choice at the invitation welcomed by a country and a pharaoh that were glad to have them because of God's favor on Joseph and the way in which Joseph helped, helped the, the Egyptians to be able to rescue themselves but also to rescue others from the famine. It's amazing that in Joseph we see God take someone from the wilderness of life, being a slave, being in prison, on, on death row, and then in a moment's notice elevated to the palace in Egypt. And through Joseph, God delivers the Hebrew people, a massive nation of 70 people, his immediate family and cousins. But that kindness on the part of the Egyptian hosts to welcome the Israelites into their country in the area of Goshen didn't last too long. Eventually, Egypt felt threatened. The Pharaoh felt threatened by the Israelites and enslaved them in order to keep them under control. It was here that Moses entered the story. And in Moses' story, we see God do the exact opposite with that of Joseph. God takes Moses out of the palace of Egypt and sends him into the wilderness, showing us that God can use anyone at any time, at any age, in any circumstance, if you're willing to say yes to his calling. And God used Moses powerfully. An 80-year-old man with no influence, with no power, no resources, He was a shepherd in this season of his life, and he had no reason to go back to Egypt until God called him to stand, oppose, and overthrow the most powerful man in the most powerful country in all the world. Why? Because of that promise he made at the burning bush. Moses, I will be with you. Now the promise God had made to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Joseph, and Judah that God would multiply their descendants in more numerous than the skies, that, that God would give to them the promised land of Canaan, that he was preparing to hand over to them trees they never planted, vineyards they never nurtured. God's pr- progressing the journey to the next step in fulfilling that promise he made generations earlier. He leads them out of Israel, or out of Egypt. He leads Israel out of Egypt by demonstrating his great authority over all the gods of Egypt. Each and every one of the plagues is a direct assault on the gods of Egypt, and they're shown time and time again, ten times in all. The God of the Hebrews is more powerful than your God. The God of the Hebrews is more powerful than your God. The God of the Hebrews is more powerful than your God. The God of the Hebrews is more powerful than your Pharaoh, who you think is God. And so Pharaoh says, leave, go. And they leave. They walk out of Egypt, free men and women. But in a very short time, Pharaoh changes his mind, unwilling to be beaten by a bunch of slaves, unwilling to bow before the God of the Hebrews, unwilling to be overwhelmed by an 80-year-old man. So he decided that he would lead his army back out and they would gather up, reclaim their slave force and drag them back here, kicking and screaming in chains. What he was too conceited to realize is that no matter what the Pharaoh wanted, no matter what his agenda or plans were for the future, the Pharaoh did not have the final word on anything regarding tomorrow. But the creator of the universe had the final word. And so at the edge of the Red Sea, the Israelites have reached a dead end. They're trapped between the army of Pharaoh behind them, closing in, and the massive sea in front of them. There is no means of escape, no way out. If God doesn't show up and rescue them yet again, they are doomed. And of course, God provides a way when there is no way. And the Red Sea opens up in front of them as every single Israelite man, woman, and child walks across on dry ground. Nobody had ever seen anything like this. Nobody even heard of anything like this happening before. The Egyptians are there as they're closing in. They they witness this miraculous sight, mountains of water on either side, and they still choose to pursue their slaves, to control their slaves, their future. 
And when they do, those walls, mountains of water come crashing back down on them, swallowing them up. And on the other side, God's people are safe. They dance, they laugh, they sing, they worship God, they thank him. For where there had been no way out, God provided a way, an escape from bondage. From the beginning, God's children had been running from him. They'd been hiding. God knew that his children could never be happy, never be fulfilled without him in their life, without him at the center of their life. But, but us in our lost state couldn't get our way back to him. We needed help. We needed direction. We were lost. And so God, who knew the way, decided this would be the day where he would begin to show them a path back to him. As they were walking away from that site, away from the Red Sea, looking over their shoulder behind them, remembering, they were sharing the story with each other of what they just saw. They were celebrating the story of God's love on display for them and the awesome deliverance that they witnessed from the hands of Pharaoh. At the same time, they're still wiping the the excess moisture off of their face and drying their hair from walking in between mountains of water. Now they would travel eight weeks away from Egypt. They were free, but they were living in the wilderness. They had no land to call their own. And there was a growing irritation by many with the conditions of living out now in the wilderness. Some even wanted to go back to Egypt, go back, step back into slavery and bondage to turn around and give up on the hope for a future. So some begin to whine about it. Even though God is daily providing everything they need to survive, Some are ready to walk away. Until on the very first day of just the third month that they came, that they had left Egypt, they come to the base of the mountain in the desert of Sinai. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, Moses, this is what you're to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you're to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves, you've seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you're to speak to the Israelites. It's here, the whole nation of Israel will hear Moses convey messages from God to them, but more than that, This nation will get to hear the voice of God himself, revealing himself not just to one or two, but to the entire people. You know, each week in this series, throughout the course of this year, we're providing for you a a conversation sheet inside your bulletin. And it's a a full page now. We heard from some of you there wasn't enough room for note-taking. So we spread it out a little, spaced it out. We gave you a couple boxes on the front to write some takeaways from the message, to write some notes about the story each week that we're recapturing and retelling in our groups and in our families. And then on the back, there's just six questions. They're pretty much the exact same every single week. And you'll, we'll, we'll kind of get into that here. Why is it that we're talking about the same questions each and every week? Well, it's because the whole nature of this story series is that we would revisit over and over again, what has God done and what does, how is it that what God does reveals to us who he is? Because we need reminded of that on a regular basis. And this is exactly what God wants us to discover every single time we open up his story. He wants us to see what he did so we can know who he is, to see what he did so we can know who he is. He says right here, he tells the, the, the Israelites, he says, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt. You've seen it. I want you to remember it. How I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. So the very first question on the back of that sheet says this. It's on the screen. What does God do? God's actions reveal who he is as he interacts with our world. God is very direct with instructions for Moses in this portion of the story. Look for and identify many of the things that you can clearly see God do or orchestrate. Now, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to invite you to turn that page over to the back. I'm going to give you the answer key. So you came today and I'm going to give you answers for your group if you want a couple of them, but then I encourage you to kind of think through it and identify some others. So if you look at this question and you ask yourself, okay, what does God do in this moment of the story? What does God do as they come across the Red Sea, as they come to Sinai, as they leave Egypt, what do we see God do? Well, it's unmistakable. What we see God do is have everything in control. 
Like, that's just what he does. Flat out, he has complete authority, complete control. Not only does he have control over the nation of Israel, but even those who are oppressing Israel, the slave owners, the Egyptians, he has control over them. Because when he wants to, they can't stand against him. Right? We just sang about that. If God is for us, who can be against us? We also see a reference in what we just read in that verse where God says that he carried us on wings of eagles. So we see God directly say, what does he do? He carries us. That he carried the entire nation on eagles' wings. Now think about that imagery for just a second. Being carried on the wings of eagles. Now if you've ever seen like a slow motion shot on the Discovery Channel or on YouTube of an eagle flying, it's pretty majestic, it's pretty remarkable. And it really seems like there's zero effort at all on the part of the eagle. And and the reason why is eagles, God designed them to glide. Now they can take off from the ground, they can flap their wings, but they can glide for miles. They can even glide up to 80 miles an hour. It's, it's, It's amazing, just incredible. And what happens is there are these thermal pockets of air that are heated from the surface of the ground reflecting. And as those hot pockets of air rise, the the eagle's wings catch it almost like a sail. And so God gives us this idea in a very graceful way with no effort on our part. He says, you didn't save yourself. You couldn't save yourself. You didn't overpower the Pharaoh. You're not even warriors. You're bricklayers. You didn't raise a sword to defend yourself or to escape. You can't even improve your circumstance in Egypt. You didn't rescue yourself. You didn't defeat the greatest army in the world. I did it. And I did it in such a way that they ran directly into a sea that I collapsed over them in an instant. Now these discoveries that we see about what does God do? What does he have the capacity for? It leads us better to to understand the second question we're asking every week. Who is God? When we look at what he's done, what does that reveal to us about who he is, his identity? The second question says, as you just identified what God has done, now share the insights that begin to reveal to you God's identity. Who is he? Well, it's pretty easy to see, well, if if he can control the sea and the ten plagues, God is powerful. He's incredibly powerful. God is in complete control. God is direct. He doesn't, like, hide things right? He doesn't beat around the bush. He sets the bush on fire and it doesn't burn up. God is near to these people. He's right there with them in the thick of it. He knows everything that's going on. God keeps his promise, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, generations in Egypt as the nation of Israel's multiplying. They liked having babies. God keeps his promise to bring them to the land of Canaan. God is victorious over the most powerful of enemies in this world. They don't cast a shadow on him. He's victorious. And God is patient, right? He waited 400 years for just the right time. But when he chose to move, there was nothing that could stand against him. I don't know about you, but these are things that you may say, yeah, yeah, I get that, I got that, I got that. These are things where in my daily life, I need to be remembered that God is in control when I feel like something might be out of control, when something catches me off guard. I need to remember that God is near to me and that he keeps his promises when I start to be afraid or when I start to worry or get anxious about what's going on that I can't see. It's here we discover something profound that we can't miss, we can't go past, In fact, all of the narratives up to this point, 50 chapters in Genesis, 18 chapters in Exodus, all of it, the the origin story of creation is for one reason. It exists to be the way that God is revealing to us, to the Israelites, who he is. To look at everything he's done and be able to identify who he is. And every moment has been building to this, the deliverance of an entire nation, a massive number of people reveals to them who he is. Now, God could have just told us with words very early on, this is who I am, this is what I can do, trust me, obey me, great, go live your life. But all of us know that wouldn't really, that wouldn't really cause us to live our lives any differently, would it? Like, like words can be empty. Like, like if God said this is who I am, we would have said, yeah, I'm crazy, I'm hearing voices, right? Because God went that route, but ultimately what did God do? He revealed himself through action miraculous signs and wonders to demonstrate who he was and what he was capable of. We wouldn't have really understood if God only put it in words who he is and what he's capable of. We wouldn't have really known if we could trust him unless we had seen him 
come through on his promises, right? If you have kids, you have grandkids. You don't just randomly, when, when you're going to have a date night, you don't just randomly or your kids are going to have a date night so they're dropping the kids off at your house, but you had plans. So you just drive down the road. You're like, yeah, that house looks nice. Let's just leave the kids there with those people, right? You don't do that. You don't know if you can trust them. You don't know if they're lunatics. You just don't know. So you trust people that you've seen have a proven track record that they're trustworthy. And so God says, I know how you're wired. I wired you. Look at everything I've done to show you who I am. I've created everything out of nothing. I created everything, every person out of the first two people. I selected Noah to restart creation with when I looked at the extent of human wickedness across the planet. I selected Abram to be the father of a great nation. Why? Because he was so good? No, he was a pagan idol worshiper. But I began to transform his heart. Because I'm good, I selected someone that didn't deserve to be selected. And I extended him a covenant, a promise. And I carried that promise through, even though Abraham wasn't perfect to Isaac, and even though Isaac wasn't perfect to Jacob, and even though Jacob wasn't perfect, I used his son Joseph, and then ultimately identified his son Judah to be the line of the Christ. I selected Joseph and allowed him to suffer deeply so that you, my children, would know who I am, so you would survive the famine. I allowed him to suffer so you would survive, so I could rescue you. And I rescued you from that famine, and I gave you the safe haven to live, the safest location in all the world behind the walls of Egypt, right there in Goshen. So you would know who I am. You would know how good I am. I even allowed you, while you were there, to multiply in great number at a great rate to the point where you even, I allowed you to experience hardship for a few generations, suffering as slaves, so that when I showed up and rescued you, you would be able to see that there is no power on the earth greater than me. See, up until this moment in human history, men and women across the world, historians and archaeologists tell us, the ancient world would try with all they could to reach up and grab at God, to grasp him, to get God's attention, almost as if they were like, hey, God, I'm over here. God, could you see me? God, could you help me? God, God what do you want me to do? I'll do anything to get your attention. They were trying to get God's attention and God's affection. How many times have you tried to get God's attention? God, don't you see me over here? Like, God, what do you want me to do? I'll do anything you ask me to do. I'll do it. How many times you tried to bargain with God? God, I'll do this if you do this for me. Or God, I promise if you do this, I'll never ever do this again. I'll never sin again. I'll never look lustfully. I'll never steal. I'll never, I'll never do any of those things again if you just do this for me. Even sometimes we have, we have good motivations to do something. Well, I'll, I'm going to pay it forward because I know if I pay it forward, God will bless me in return. So then it's really more about me than about the person I'm helping. Through this deliverance, God is showing them no one could ever get God's attention. Nobody. Nobody deserves his grace. Nobody deserves his presence. Nobody deserves his goodness. But because of who he is, He's loving and good. He chooses to be generous. He chooses to bless with his presence. He chooses to engage in our lives. He chooses to set them free. We know when we look at the ancient world, especially across the region of Mesopotamia, the first historical record of the collections of people into societies, different civilizations, would attempt to collectively ascend and rise and grab God's attention to try to get to God in fact, they would build often their cities on mountains, high places. And the reason they would build them on high places is because they thought they would be in closer proximity to God so they could impress him or they could at least hear from him. And if they lived, if, if collections of people lived in lands that were pretty flat, what they would do is they would engage in a massive uh, uh, excavation project and they would build a ziggurat. It's a cool word, ziggurat. You should use it. We should use it more. But a ziggurat was basically where they would grab a bunch of soil. Maybe you've seen this. Here's like a, a, a cartoon or you've seen it in a movie. Like you think about Mayan temples or those kinds of things. A ziggurat was basically where there was a flat place. They would gather a bunch of soil and rock and sand and they would build a base that was big and wide and thick. And then on top of that, once it dried, they would do it again, just a little bit smaller. And then when they would do that, they would do it again and do it again. Sometimes four and five and six levels high. And then at the very top, normally what they would put, not a house, a temple. It would be a place of worship. And that was their human attempt to reach and grasp for God, to try to get his attention, to try to get closer in proximity to him. You know what? The same thing happens in our world today. We just don't build ziggurats. We try to build good deeds. And we think if we're good enough and we measure up that God will give us his attention and he'll give us his affection and he'll give us access to heaven. We, we, we so often, society thinks that we can perform to a degree well, God will accept us. Unfortunately, that's not the gospel message, what the gospel says. Right here, the Israelites are that just two months ago, they were still slaves. 
Now they're camped at the base of a mountain called Sinai. And the Lord speaks to Moses. He says, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking. Speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. I want them to hear my voice speak to you so they always trust you as the leader that I've assigned to them. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. This is what he's going to do. And he told the Lord, what the, pe- the people were whining and complaining. They don't like this. They, they, some of them want to go back to Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, here's what I want you to do, Moses. Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Now, historians tell us civilizations, ancient civilizations in the ancient world, would try to elevate themselves higher and higher and higher to attempt to get to God, to gain the attention of God. But on Mount Sinai, the one true God, as he always does, he flips the script. He flips everything they're expecting upside down. And rather than telling some man or some woman how they can ascend to the highest heavens and get God's attention, the God of the Hebrew people who has just recently shown them his mighty power is telling them, get ready because you can't ever get to me, but I'm coming down to you. I'm descending on the mountain in front of all the people. You're going to see me and you're going to hear me. This is remarkable that that the God of the universe would leave the heavens and descend down the mountain into fellowship with piddly little human beings that are whining and complaining because they've been free from slavery for eight weeks and they want to go back to 400 years of slavery. Like, like this, is, this is ridiculous. This is insanity. God is leaving there and coming here in the sight of everyone so no one misses it. Do you see the gospel thread here? God coming to earth. You know, religions in the world do have one thing in common. They believe that the creator of the universe has expectations for humanity. But that's where the comparisons stop. That the, that the creator of the universe has things that he expects us to live up to. Be, because we have free will, because we have choice, that there is a stewardship issue with our lives, with our resources, with our values, with our energy, with our abilities and gifts. But please listen to me. That is the only thing similar between Christianity and any other world religion. It breaks down from there. Where Christianity differs from every other world religion is other religions believe mankind's goal is to try to get up that staircase, to try to reach up and to try harder and to try harder and to try and obey God and try to meet his expectations with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our discipline, that, when we, that our lives are measured on a scale, that here are the bad things we've done, here are the good things we've done. We've got to try to get the good to outweigh the bad so we don't feel guilt and shame. And then maybe, just maybe, God will accept us. And if he doesn't accept us in this lifetime, then maybe we get another lifetime. But if we don't do good, we come back as a rock or a dog or something like that. Christianity is not trying to focus us. Christianity, the gospel message, is not about us reaching to God. Christianity is the reality that God reaches down to us with grace. That that the God of the universe descended to earth and he came in human form to pay the ultimate penalty that separated us in the first place, the penalty for sin. Even here, as God descends on Mount Sinai, what he's doing reveals to us that the God of the universe wants a relationship with you. He wants a relationship with me. This is fascinating. And this relationship he wants is available to everyone. And it's not about you being good enough. It's about him being good enough. See, it's not really about you at all. It's it's about him. And he's inviting you and your worst enemy on the planet to the same table of grace. Because both of you, it's your only hope. See, God's law was never meant to be a list of things that if we kept them, we thought we were doing good and we might get to heaven. No, no, no. We can't keep his laws. Adam and Eve had one. They couldn't keep it. You think we can keep 10? Not a chance. And even there's more than that because throughout the rest of the Torah, God will give them over 600 mitzvot, which are the laws of the Old Testament for the Hebrew people. So then why does God give us the law? If we can't do it, if we can't, be perfect, if we can't measure up, if we can't obey him, then why give us the law at all? Well, Paul's going to talk about that, and we'll get there in the fall. But as we stay right here in the book of Exodus, let me point to a couple of reasons why. One, he gives us his law to continue to save us from the consequences of future sin. Think about it, just a couple of the Ten Commandments. Let's look at the first one. 
This re relates to our relationship with God. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, why would God give us this command? You shall have no, no other gods before me. No other, nothing else, no other person, no other thing, no other power should be on the throne of your life, the throne of your heart. Why does he do that? Well, he wants us to know that no other thing, no other person, no other power can ever accomplish, provide, or compare to what he has already offered to us. There is nothing else that's better than the salvation offered from Jesus Christ. He's already rescued us. He's already set us free. There is nothing that will be greater in value than the life of Jesus on the cross. Another reason why. Because anything that you worship more than God, anything you build your life on that is more significant to you than God will never, ever, 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 ever be able to deliver on the promises you hope it can deliver on. You build your life around money, what hope will you have when it runs out? When it doesn't do what you hoped it would do? When it doesn't do what you told it to do? You build your life around your own personal pleasure, what hope will you have when you're bored? Because a little bit later tonight, you'll be bored. Maybe you're bored right now, what hope will you have? If your life is built around pleasure, and you're like, I don't really like this message, maybe I'll try again next Sunday. You build your life around another person, even someone that matters a lot to you, what hope will you have when they let you down, when they sin against you, when they disappoint? or when they're gone. Only God can faithfully deliver on every one of the thousands of promises that he makes throughout his word. God gives us his law to save us from the pain and consequences of future sin. I'll give you another illustration, one that relates to our relationship with each other. He says, you shall not steal. Pretty simple, pretty quick, right to the point, don't steal. Why would God give us this command? Because he doesn't want us held prisoner by the addiction for more crap in our lives. He doesn't want us to believe this lie that if we have more junk, somehow we're gonna feel more significant or fulfilled because we will never be able to scratch that itch with material stuff or with money. It won't bring us more fulfillment in life. It'll just bring a greater and greater carnal drive for more and more and more and more and it won't satisfy. Another reason why he would give us this command is because he doesn't want us to do something that would complicate our lives, that would ruin our lives. If you were in the ancient world at this time in Exodus, God is saying, don't steal. Why? Well, because they'll cut off your arm, and if you've already lost both your arms, they might cut off your leg, or they will execute you and your life will be over. Don't do it. It's not worth the consequence. To our modern world today, God is saying, don't steal. Why? Because you could be in prison. You could be taken away from the people, and that's what God came to save is people. It's what matters most to God, should matter most to us. If you steal, you could be taken away, ripped out of the arms of the people that matter most to you in all the world. It's not worth it. It's a temporary fleeting desire for something that will just cause you pain. God wants us, and a third reason. Why does he want us to steal? Because he wants us to trust him. That he'll provide everything we need. That we don't have to feel like we have no options, like we have no hope. He wants us to trust him with everything. He even tells us, he gives us a promise, Jesus does, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. So God gives us his law to help save us from the consequences of sin. Secondly, the Ten Commandments are not ten instructions for how to earn God's favor. Why did he give us the law? To save us from the pain and consequence of the future sin that we could create, the, the self-sabotage, the destruction. But the Ten Commandments are not the pathway to salvation. They are, however, a fundamental outline of a radically new, redeemed community on earth unlike any other. He said it right there in the verse we read. I have called you to be a nation set apart, holy, singled out from every other. It's a kingdom. It's a community unlike any other community on earth. God wants to establish a people on earth. Not to have Israel become the world power and assert their dominance. Not for the United States to assert its dominance and cling to faith. No, he wants to establish a people on earth that transcends geographical boundaries, that reveals to the rest of the world the most beautiful and fulfilling way of life to live. And so he wants, at this time, this nation Israel, but someday the baton is gonna pass beyond just the Jews to Gentiles as well, to his bride, his body, the church, to be the public demonstration of a better life available through Jesus than any other way to live. The question is, are you reflecting that? In our obedience to God's law, he wants us to reflect a radical new community built on grace, and love, and mercy. 
God's mission to save the world gave birth to a church. The church is God's vehicle of hope for the rest of the world so that we can be a living testimony of the life he's created to live, a life in community with each other. So the question is, is that you? God gave the Hebrew people the Ten Commandments and they couldn't keep them. No one could. No matter how hard you try, you can't keep all of God's rules all the time. God knows that and he wants you to know it too. In fact, only one person would ever be able to keep all the rules and many years later, God would send his son to do just that, to stand in our place and be perfect for us because rules could never save us, only the son of God could. God tells them, I brought you out of Egypt on eagle's wings. It was easy for me. It was easy for you. I have supreme authority and power. I speak and galaxies are made. Now trust me. The big picture here, the big gospel thread here is that God delivers them first. He spends 50 chapters in Genesis, 18 in Exodus, showing them who he is, that they can trust him, that he is a God of miracles. He can do the impossible signs and wonders. He's showing them how much he loves them. He's showing them how much they can trust his promises and his word. Showing them that he's faithful. God delivers them first and he asks for obedience second. Make sure you don't confuse those. Because grace always comes first. The law comes second. And he gives us his law not to saddle us with guilt, but his law is actually a part of his grace to set us free. He wants to save us from the shame and guilt of the past, but he also wants to save us from the pain and consequence of the future, that if we choose to act on that carnal nature, we will wreck ourselves. And so the law of God can't deliver us, only Jesus can deliver us, and he delivers us so we can experience God's commands, and a desire changes in our hearts to want to trust him more and to want to obey You know, one of the words that we often talk about in relationship to God and in relationship to each other is the word love. In our culture, in the English language, the word love is a pretty tired word. You know, I could tell you that, uh, you know, I love my kids, and I could tell you that I love pizza, and I could tell you that I love a certain song or a favorite movie. But you know that even though I use that same word love in all those instances, the definition doesn't mean the same thing. Because I love pizza more than anything, right? You know that. Some of you are sleeping. That's fine. My best attempt at humor tonight. Um, Love is a tired word. Do you know how you can really tell if you love someone? Ask this question. Is my greatest delight in life when his heart or her heart is delighted? Because that's the heart of God. If you use the word love towards a person, yet your greatest delight is when you get what you want from them, there's some work to be done in your heart. Let me give you an example. You know, there's, there's hardly anything I wouldn't do or try to increase the pleasure and joy that my daughters experience in life. You know, I delight most when they're delighted. And any parent knows that. I mean, it's just so rewarding and satisfying to see them just, just, just alive with joy. And we take great delight in that as parents in the same way that God delights in our joy. And so I try as hard as possible to not miss a single dance class that two of my daughters have each and every week on Thursday nights. Now, do I not want to miss a dance class because I love dance and I wear leotards under my clothes? No, that is not the truth. I don't wear tights, and I don't know half the time what they're talking about. They talk, they're they're in ballet, they talk about first position. To me, that's the lead-off batter. I want to know who's on deck, and they're like, Dad, there's no batters in ballet. I'm like, okay, I'm out of this. But I'm learning that to become a great parent is to discover I'm most delighted and joyful when my children are delighted. Now that doesn't mean they get everything they want. God doesn't give us everything we want. But he delights when we're delighted. And I'm learning that as a dad. This principle applies to marriage as well. But if I'm honest with you, we find it easier in our culture to feel this with our kids who are naive and immature. But often there's hurts and habits and hang-ups that keep us from expressing this or feeling this in marriage. And let me be the first to admit that my marriage with my wife is not perfect. She's in the room, so I can't say that it is because she could tell everybody that I'm a liar, right? And because we're unperfect human beings, our marriage will never be perfect. See, we have a big issue 
in our marriage, a big issue, and that issue is about six feet tall, okay? I'm a guy, and I'm in the marriage, and I'm an imperfect human being. But one of the things that I've witnessed produce the greatest results in my marriage are the days occasionally where I get it right and I prioritize my wife's pleasure, my wife's desire, my wife's excitement over my own. I can honestly say that, that my greatest delight, it's growing slowly to become, not the moments where I get what I want, but the moments where my wife's heart is most delighted. I'm learning that as my love for my wife continues to deepen, I experience the best personal pleasure when she is, the, is delighted. And some of the hardest days are when her heart is breaking and I can't fix it. Married couples, is your greatest delight in life when your spouse is delighted? Or is your greatest delight in life when you get what you want from them? It's a challenging question to ponder and it might move from preaching a message to meddling. But we need to sit on it. And we're gonna explore that more this Saturday in the marriage conference. If you haven't yet signed up to be a part of it on Saturday, I encourage you to do that. God gives us his law in part because in love, if he's shown us his love and he wants us to respond in love, he wants to communicate to us crystal clear what it is that delights his heart. And what delights his heart is our obedience to his law. In the same way that I as a parent are delighted that one time a year when my kids obey me, right? That one time, it's like, yes, this is great. And then we're back to reality, right? God's a good dad and he knows what delights our hearts. He wants to delight our hearts, but he also wants us to return in kind, to follow his example and to delight his heart with obedience. So as our trust grows in God, We want to obey him more. As we discover more about who God is, how remarkable he is, we want to obey obey him more because our trust is deepening. And as our love for Jesus deepens, for all he's done for us, our delight in life is knowing that he is delighted in us when we say yes to him in obedience. In fact, Jesus doesn't beat around the bush. In John chapter 14, he tells us, if you love me, you will keep my commands. He makes it crystal clear. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. If we don't keep his commands, we can see the inverse of that. It shows we don't really love him. I want to summarize just with four statements. This might be something you want to jot down. One of these, I don't necessarily recommend all four because you'll have a hard enough time focusing on one thing, but right there where it says notes from the message, if we were to kind of take this message and summarize it into four statements, maybe one of these is kind of a a connection for you. It's a takeaway. It's the Holy Spirit kind of whispering in your ear. Maybe the first one is, you know what, I need to remember, I've I've already been delivered through grace. So because I love God, I'm going to obey God. The, The deliverance comes first, the law comes second. I don't do the right thing so I get God's attention. I don't do the right thing so I get God's acceptance. I've already been accepted by God, therefore I want to do what he asked me to do. In love, I obey. A second thing, obedience to God saves me from destruction. Obedience to God to confess and repent of my sin because he's faithful and just to forgive me of it is is being let go from the sins of the past. But obedience to God going forward is to save me from destruction in the future so that my own carnal desires and flesh don't wreck my life. A third thing, obedience to God makes me a testimony of this radical new redeemed family I'm a part of called the church. And the fourth thing, obedience to God shows my delight in life, my greatest delight, is pleasing him more than any other. Would you pray with me? Father God, sometimes when we look at your commands, when we look at your instructions, when we look at your law, we're often saddled with a sense of insecurity because we know we don't measure up. God, it is so refreshing to us to know that you agree with us, that we don't measure up, that we never will, and that a relationship with you is not dictated on us trying our best. A relationship with you is fully finished by the work of the cross and our faith, grace through faith. So Lord, we just end tonight by saying thank you for the gift we don't deserve. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we say thank you for your law. Because not only does it set us free, 
it keeps setting us free. Not only have we been saved by the fulfillment of the law in Jesus, but you keep saving us as we choose to obey you and live life your way. Because the way you've created us to live is, is one of the greatest testimonies we have about how our faith in Jesus radically transforms our lives. It transforms our community so that it's attractive to people on the outside that have been so beaten up and abused and neglected and ostracized that are so hurting and wounded that they can say, maybe, just maybe, this is a place inside the church of Jesus where I can find hope, where I can find restoration, where I can find healing, where I can find miracles. And Lord, we thank you for your law because it shows us how we can honor you in love and delight your heart by choosing a life of yes. Yes, Lord, I will obey. It's in the awesome and mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen.